then has been summed up in four statements. A direct transmission outside scriptures and apart from tradition. No dependence on words and letters. Direct pointing to the human mind and seeing into one's own nature and becoming Buddha. That is, becoming enlightened, awakened from the normal hypnosis under which almost all of us go round like somnambules. It's extraordinary how much interest has existed in Zen in the United States, especially in the years since the war with Japan. Naturally, I've often meditated on the reasons for this interest. I think, first of all, the appeal of Zen lies in its unusual quality of humor. Religions aren't, as a rule, humorous in any way. Religions are serious. And when one looks at Zen art and reads Zen stories, it is quite apparent that something is going on here which isn't serious in the ordinary sense, however sincere it may be. The next thing I think that has appealed to Westerners is that Zen has no doctrines. There is nothing you have to believe, and it doesn't moralize at you very much. It's not particularly concerned with morals at all. It's a field of inquiry, rather like physics. And you don't expect a physicist to discuss authoritatively about morals, even though as a human being, he has moral interests and problems. But as a physicist, he is not a moral authority. Or if you go to an oculist or ophthalmologist to have your eyes adjusted, that is so you can see clearly. And Zen is spiritual ophthalmology. Another thing that appeals very much to Western students about Zen is that they've read their Zen from Suzuki and from some of my writings and from R.H. Blythe. And these people present a rather different kind of Zen from that which you will find today in Japan. They present what is essentially early Chinese Zen from the old writings ranging from about shortly before 700 AD to 1000 AD. And that Zen has a very different flavor from modern Japanese Zen. And so, of course, many of the people who go to study Zen in Japan disapprove of Dr. Suzuki thoroughly, and also, naturally, of my exposition of Zen, because we don't make a great fetish of studying Zen by sitting. Japan today, they sit and they sit and they sit. R.H. Blythe asked the Zen master, what would you do if you had only one half hour left to live? And he said, I would do Zazen, which means he would sit like the Buddha here and uh, practice meditation. disappointed in this answer. And he said, you know, sitting is only one way of doing Zen. Buddhism speaks of the four dignities of man, walking, standing, sitting, and lying. And so Zazen is simply the Japanese word for sitting Zen. There must also be walking Zen, standing Zen, and lying Zen. You should know, for example, how to sleep in a Zen way. That means to sleep thoroughly. Zen has been described as when hungry, eat, when tired, sleep. And when the student got that description, he said, well, doesn't everybody do that? And the master said, they don't. When hungry, they don't just eat, but think of 10,000 things. When tired, they don't just sleep, but dream innumerable dreams. 
so in a sense, this sounds like the old Western truism. Whatever you, your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. But that's not the same thing as Zen. A lot of people like to see if they could sum up Zen in that way. In the Latin motto of the school I used to go to in England, Agedum Agis, act when you act.